Welcome back to The Afterward, a conversation about the future of words. We are glad to have David Adeleke and Julia Travioso here with us to continue our conversation about new entrepreneurs and innovation and how that might give us a boom in global prosperity. So, China. We've mentioned China uh, before when we were talking about the BRICS countries, and Julia was sharing a little bit about um, some of the feelings and trade Uh, challenges that are happening right now between Brazil and China. But China's pumping a lot of money into Africa right now. Jack Ma, who founded Alibaba, that's kind of the Chinese equivalent of Amazon. Um, Jack Ma's put up $10 million for the African Netpreneur Prize and the Alibaba eFounders Initiative, which will support 100 African entrepreneurs. How will China's investment change African economies, David? Well, that's a very interesting question. So, there are two, there are two We're things. Very interesting um, answer, David. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> two, there are two things about this, and I mean, two sides to to this. The first is, um, China has a lot of cash to invest, uh, and so anyone who is willing to take China's cash, China will give. It doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> and this is also the problem. It doesn't really matter what your political ideologies are, whether you're democratic or whether you're autocratic, it doesn't really matter to China. As long as you want the money, um, you're going to get it. But that's the other side. Um, that's the other side um, to it. The, that's, uh, and that, that leads to a problem. There is no check you know, to, um, 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 to, to where China can invest in. Um, so China is pumping money into a country where the president is is, is, is is a dictator or a country that has no, that there is no one to put the executive arm of, of government in, in check. There is no balance to how um, the government operates. Everything is skewed towards the executive or everything is skewed. The power, the power dynamics are skewed towards the political elite. So there is, there is really no ideology that keeps China in check in that regard. And so that also creates a, a problem. And then another part of it is China loans you money or lends you money for a particular amount of years. And you're unable to, it will be a lot of money at high interest rates, but you're unable to pay back. What happens when you default on your loan? Do they take over the, um, the infrastructure that you have, that you have loaned the money for? You know, so, so these are all the many things that people have to think about um, when talking about this. But to be honest, African um, uh, economies, they need the money to develop. They need money to build infrastructure. And it, it seems like anyone who is willing to give out the cash, they will take. It doesn't really matter who the person is. And sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it seems like it doesn't really matter what the long-term um, impact of taking that loan is. So that's, that's where you, you know, that's how you assess China's involvement in Africa's economy. But the, another side to it is you have the Africa Development Bank, which is in some ways trying to match the level of um, investment that is coming in. So the Africa Development Bank is actually committing a lot of money to infrastructure development um, across the across the continent. But the fact of the matter is you can't really compare the financial power of China and the financial power of the African Development Bank. It's just, the gap is just too much. I think I learned more about global politics in the last three minutes than I have in the last several months. <laughs> really, that, that, was a, that was one of the most lucid explanations I've heard of what's going on there. I, you know, I keep hearing little things um, in the media, I think uh, news stories crop up. You read something in a a think piece of some kind, but I really did not understand how all those links fit together until you just explained it to me. Uh, Julia, do you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, I can't really comment on the ground situation of what's happening there, but I feel like there, that's something David said that we need to like pay a lot of attention because it it happens everywhere. And we can't think that money comes from free when somebody is investing they're hoping to be paid back right so people talk about like getting an investment is this amazing amazing thing and it, like it doesn't come with strings attached to it right and we need to understand what are these strings and 
understand if we're we are willing to compromise, right? More than just like, okay, this is the the interest, I will have to pay something around that much, but also understand the ideological things that's happening around it and trying to see like where the money is going and what is it returning for us, right? So this can happen in like country to country and business to business. It's the same idea, right? A country is nothing more than a huge business. I, I don't think, I don't know if you agree with me, but that's the impression I have. That's a really interesting concept. A country is no more than a huge business. I hadn't thought about it that way. Thank you. Right, right. I mean, honestly, and the, and the, I think we all understand that money is not free, but those strings and that risk that's involved, you know, it you have to decide is is this risk worth your your entrepreneur um, get someone else getting involved and and having somebody call the shots on that. So or or as David said, you know, taking over when the loan gets defaulted. So these are tough decisions um, because we need this entrepreneurship and. In um, 2019, about 23.3% of the Brazilian adult population was involved in early stage entrepreneurial activity. It's a little bit what you were talking about earlier, Julia. Um, they own businesses um, that was less than 42 months old. So Julia, what are some of the businesses people are starting right now? What's hot in Brazil besides the weather? <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of hot weather. But uh, it's all, we, we also have, um, I feel like we have two things happening at the same time. And I'm going to try to organize for you in ways you can understand. So if you don't, pre please feel free to stop me and ask questions because it's a little bit complex and it's kind of outside my expertise. But we have some of this huge companies of like angel investors and people who are trying to put money into new ideas. So we have huge companies who instead of pouring all their money into studying a new solution or creating a new technology, they're making little investments in other people's ideas and just trying to see if it pans out. So in this scenario, there's a lot of things happening in the healthcare side of things. There's a lot of things happening in the food side of things. Also, we have a lot of businesses in this kind of basic needs, right? We have a lot of people trying to find ways to better health, find ways to better hunger, find ways to better, I don't know, everything. Like this ground rules like we need this to be able to think of other things and to evolve uh, but that's something that's very limited to a kind of circle that's already used to talking about it and that's already used to uh, knowing where to find investments so there's a lot of business schools giving trainings there's a lot of people trying to create this, these new ideas and pitch to these investors. And although it's good work and it needs to be done, I feel like maybe this money would be better invested if it was shared between these projects and projects created in a more, I don't know how to say this in English, but with less less structures. So I don't need to have like a degree in administration or business or technology to be able to create something awesome. And we have a lot of people who have like no running water, right? And we need water. So there are people who without using amazing apps or technology are so creating solutions to these problems. So I feel like what's happening right now is we have problems and we have people living these problems. And then we have solutions being created by people who don't leave these problems. So there's a gap between the idea and how to apply it. Because when you try to apply it, it's not, 
it doesn't match with the reality of the people who need to use it. So I feel like maybe we should try to get this money and give it to the people who are already developing things because a gambiarra is nothing more than a prototype, right? It's an idea that was created with resources that were meant for something else, but they serve this, pro this purpose well. And you don't need to waste a lot of time like creating this design thinking processes where you will find the perfect solution because the perfect solution is already there. Somebody created it and they're using it right now. So maybe you should find these people and give these people the money so that they can develop this idea in a way that makes sense for them instead of just talking about it in like this mirrored rooms and, and using difficult English words because we are full of English terms for things that we can say in Portuguese. So I feel like people are trying hard to keep these two words apart. They want for this, this, this side to not be able to access that fund. So I don't know if you understood. You can ask me anything you want. I think it sounds pretty clear, Julia. It sounds like what we need are some ditches dug. So you've got one side of your entrepreneurs, you've got the investors and you need a ditch between them to get the funnel, the money between them. Yeah, okay. How about you, David? What's hot in Nigeria besides the weather in, in entrepreneurship? Well, there's a lot of attention in tech right now because, um, I mean, tech is, it sounds, it's a cliche, but tech is the future because it just opens up um, tremendous opportunities that don't currently exist and especially digital technology, internet related um, innovation because the internet is in, in some way, it's not in every case, but it's in, it's in some way a level playing field. Anyone with access to the internet can build something for themselves. So you see a lot of innovation around um, um, technology, around the creator economy, a lot of young people are taking up um, their hobbies and or their passions and turning them into into careers and then building businesses around their creativity. But that's what you see a lot of um, in in Africa or in Nigeria. Love that. So, what do you have to have in order to see? disruptive innovation that creates prosperity in new markets. I think I used all our vocab words there. <laughs> I'll tell you, Holland. What do you have to do to see disruptive innovation that creates prosperity in new markets? Well, I think, I think the number one driver of innovation is just, um, it's audacity. And I mean, I don't want to sound like a motivational speaker, but let's, let's take the U.S. example. People who live in America have access to tremendous amounts of capital. So because there's access to tremendous amounts of capital, they can essentially wake up one morning and try something, let me use the word absurd. And because there is capital, there is room, there is patience, um, and then there is, the, the market is open-minded. The, mar the market is open to, to these new things. They, they can run their idea or test run their idea for some months, in some cases for years. And after a few years, they see if this thing can succeed or if it can't. Here, you don't have that luxury. You don't have access to as much capital as you want. So people have to essentially uh, bootstrap their way to, to profitability or to, to break even. And this, is, this doesn't even mean that they're growing into big corporations. It just means that they've created something viable within a, within a small frame that they can, they can run as businesses. So if there is more uh, money that is in the economy, that leads to more confidence and more audacity on the part of, of innovators. So in simple terms, I would say that people need more money to build disruptive innovation. It makes, it makes good sense. I mean, yeah, money. Money is what you need to make more money. Exactly. Uh, Julia, what do you think? 
Well, there's this phrase by somebody whose name I don't remember, but it says money makes the world go round. And that's kind of what's going on, right? We need money to be able to keep moving. So something that David said, and it applies here too, is this idea that we need to like bootstrap our way into something at least a little bit sustainable before we can actually start thinking about great new ideas. But what I also would like to add in, in this mix is we need a little bit of faith also in ourselves first. So there's a lot of questioning, there's a lot of doubt, we're always wondering maybe I shouldn't be doing this, maybe this, this won't work, maybe I, I won't be able to do this, maybe I should quit and try something else. And that's mostly because when we're not making money doing this thing, we feel like it failed. And that's what David said. If you don't have time to test run it, you, you will probably feel like you failed. And so we go back to the money thing, but we also need to understand um, what our limitations are and what our potentials are. And maybe try to invest in the things we do better and save a little bit of time and mostly try to partner with people who could have other capital, right? Because there's the financial capital, but there is a lot of other kinds of capital. We, we have intellectual capital, we have cultural capital. So I feel like I, I'm always circling back to the same point of creating this, this network, this, this group of people who you can count on to help you make your idea come to life. Because if you're just sitting in your house waiting for somebody to invest in your business or for you to miraculously be able to make a lot of money, um, you will fail, mostly fail. And I think this is something that happens a lot here in Brazil. We have more than 70% of businesses closing in less than two years. So that's an, um, an alarming amount of people who have to give up their dreams. So we need money and we need faith because, and we need people to help we, to help us get there, right? Because there's not, there's not investment for everybody, but everybody needs to put food on their table. So maybe we can fund ourselves and we can help ourselves at least get to a point where this is something we can present to an investor or this is something that will be able to create innovation in at scale, right? Because it's possible to create innovation in small scenarios, but to be able to scale that, you need external investment. So, yeah. Mm. Holland, this is so good. I'm hearing amazing words coming um, from David and Julia tonight. Um, I think my favorite so far um, that David has said is audacity. Um, and then I love Julia's word about faith and, you know, just trying to harness both of those ideas together um, as we think about this. So Julia, you do have some distinctive ideas. I mean, you're, you are just very passionate and bubbling over with what you would like to see happen um, in this idea of philanthropy and models about entrepreneurship and investment. So tell us a little bit more about your vision for CTV Labs and what you hope to accomplish. Um, okay, so we've got to my favorite part of the conversation. Yes. Um, this There's a new project I'm creating right now, and I say it's a project but because we're prototyping as we speak, so we haven't tested it yet, but it has a lot of a lot to do with everything I was saying before. It has a lot to do with community, it has a lot to do with creating connection between people who have money and people who need 
this money to be able to make their solutions grow. And also this idea of creating a safe space for people to talk about what they are going through because to be an entrepreneur is also something that's very lonely. You need to give a lot of your energy into it and you can't like, oh, I, sometimes you can't go like on a happy hour, all your friends are going to, and you feel like you're isolated. And that's something that's very common. And it's something that maybe will cause the person to give up on their idea. So we go back to that idea of faith. And there's nothing better to keep our faith alive than other people who believe in what we're doing. So... Um, what we're creating right now is a platform. It's called Engaja Flix, which is a subscription model where we're creating this community of people that we call fazedores who are somehow surviving, but not only surviving, they're also telling stories about their heritage, they're creating spaces to innovate and to find new solutions to our everyday life problems and mostly who are helping our country become the country we would be proud to live in because right now that's not a reality so Aside from the community, the idea of this platform is also to bring like gamified challenges where people will create their own communications plan. They will create their own ways of talking about their businesses and presenting their businesses in a more professional way. And that's something that's very essential because when we don't believe in ourselves, we don't believe in what we're doing and we can talk about it in a way that people will want to buy into the idea, right? Because it's, it's very easy to sell a phone that everybody's using, but it's not very easy to sell something that doesn't even exist yet or something that's new or something that's your own vision on the world. So the idea is to find a way to help them exercise themselves and create their own way of doing it. So we go back to what I said in the first episode about the importance of autonomy and people being able to tell their own stories. So um, aside from that, we're also connecting these fazedores with people who would like to see their businesses thrive. So we're actually crowdfunding the investments in a way that we don't need to be worried about what are the strings that are attached with these investments because we know that these people understand what the fazedores are doing, they understand their reality and they are like buying into the idea because they would like to see these people thrive. So it's kind of philanthropic, but it's also a lot about mutual aid right? We have a lot of inequality and this happens in Brazil and this happens everywhere. So what better way to bridge the gap than to make this money move around, right? And, and find people who would rather give their mothers something created by a small artisan than something bought in the local shopping mall. And people who want to make a farmer's market a place with more people instead of just going to the supermarket. So the idea is to find these this people and create this one place, which is an online space where these people and this kind of ecosystem can thrive, right? So we're a lot about creative economy, circular economy, solidarity economy. Um, we're kind of blending all these ideas together to crowdfund investment for people who would make great use of this money and also giving them an opportunity to have services and products in their homes that have spirit and that have the soul and that have the stories 
of the people who made it with it. So it's not something that's disconnected, right? We're always feeling so disconnected because we're online all the, all the time. So it's nice to know who made my earrings and it's nice to know who found this shirt on a, some some garbage and turned it into this beautiful thing that I'm wearing today. So I feel like I'm here with you, but I'm all, also around the people who I love and who've made this work into creating this for me and for everybody else. So, mm. yeah, I feel like I'm trying to do something, right? I, I don't like to feel like I'm powerless in, in the context of everything that's going on. So we're trying to bring change. I love this, Julia. Wow, such passion. Um, I, you, you've ticked a couple boxes in my mind. And David, I'm wondering if this is something that you have seen um, in your dealings in Africa, or if this is something that could work in Africa? I, I think it's an interesting concept. Um, I think it could work. I don't know of any instances where it currently does, but I think it could work with a lot of, but it will require a lot of um, market orientation, you know, helping people understand that this is possible. And if people understand that it is possible, and they see how it benefits them, then definitely I think you can you can apply it in many other contexts, but I don't see how it currently can. I, mean, I don't see where it currently works or if it currently works here. I, I appreciate the idea of the gamification um, and, and the crowdfunding um, idea. We had on our very first episode, Holland, I don't know if you, you I'm sure you remember um, Connie and Dan Kazmier. And they have crowdfunded the second edition of their board game. It's a chai game. And they crowdfunded this thing. And it's the second game now ready to go. So it's, it is kind of exciting to see that it is possible without, you know, and, you know, as, a, as an entrepreneur to tap into that market. That's exciting, Julia. And I hope that this thing can get translated to many other countries. Okay, last question before we wind up. What's a metaphor, what's a word picture to help us better understand new entrepreneurs in emerging economies? Uh, a metaphor, a metaphor. I would use, let me see. This is always such a tricky question. But you all have both used some really lovely metaphors as you've been talking, so you can reuse one that you have already shared. I can't think of any. I can't think of any metaphors right now. But whatever I would say has would have to uh, mean resilience, because resilience and tenacity, because that's the thing that I know that people in my country have a lot of. It's not always an advantage because it means that we can adapt to any situation and we shouldn't adapt to any situation or every situation, but it just shows how, how willing we are to beat the odds. So whatever metaphor I would, I would use would have to describe that. Excellent. Yeah, so I'm also having trouble thinking of a metaphor, but what I would say um, to help everybody else understand um, how things are going on here, I would say community. I'm, I'm always talking about the same thing. I, I think you guys are already bored, but... <laughs> Um, I think that's the most important thing because uh, for, for you guys to understand a little bit of the scenario here, we have more than 50% of the homes in Brazil with only one parent and it's usually a single mom and she needs to work and she needs to take care of the house and she needs to care, take care of the children. And there's the saying, right? It's that it takes a village to care for a child. So we need to make these connections in order to stay alive in a place that's not very interested in keeping us alive. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm always talking about it because I feel like it's what, what has been saving me from, I don't know, 
I don't I, I don't know since forever I think and I feel like it's something that we are having more and more trouble accessing because we're online and we're we think we're close to that influencer who lives in some pretty house and eats in fancy restaurants and we we feel like we're close to them because we're watching their content and we we see their everyday routine but it doesn't usually apply to our scenario so we have a lot of people feeling frustrated and we have a lot of people feeling lonely so it's important to build community and i like the idea of building community because it brings the notion that it's not something that will arrive if you don't go looking for it and if you don't cherish it and if you don't care for it because having a lot of followers in your profile it doesn't mean anything because when you actually need something who will be there to help you right you need to be able to have this safe space where you can be frustrated where you cannot be perfect where you can cry where you can be angry and you will feel welcomed so i feel like this is important and and this is what keeps a lot of businesses alive here in brazil when they don't have funding when they don't have access to all the fancy buildings in midtown so it's how we have survived in brazil since the dawn of time You both, you both talk about resilience and survival and community. And so these were lovely. Well done. Well done. Okay, before we go, Julia, where can people learn more about you or connect with you or find out how to help uh, actualize the vision of CTV Labs? Um, okay, so I'm going to leave you a very easy way to find information about everything. Uh, it's through Instagram. It's engageaflix.club. And in that profile, you will find all the links and all the explanations and detailed step-by-step -step, um, questions and, and everything else that I didn't have time to talk about here. And I hope you connect. I hope I can hear from you. And if you're interested in helping out, you can be free to DM me in that profile and I will be glad to make this connection. And Julia, we're going to put this in our show notes, but spell that out for us, please. Okay, it's E-N-G-J-A-F-L-I-X dot club, C-L-U-B. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, David, how can people get in touch with you or be part of something that you're working on? Oh, okay. I have a website. I'm davidabiliki.com. Uh, I mean, this the spelling would be, the spelling of my last name would be in the, in the podcast notes. And then I have a podcast, a, sorry, a newsletter where I analyze the media business in Africa. That newsletter is called Communique, and you can find it on Substack. David I .substack So my website, David .com, and then my newsletter, David I .substack I shared one of David's articles on Twitter. It was, um, he talked about the future of podcasting in Africa. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. 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 It was, uh, I was like, Oh, somebody's talking about this. This is exciting. This is okay. exciting. Thank you. All right. Thanks to both David and Julia. We'd like to invite everyone else to join us next week. We'll be talking about millennial culture in the developing world. We'll uh, find out how young adults across Africa, Asia, and Latin America think and what they're up to that affects us. We'll have Mongera Mutiga, founder and CEO of a business intelligence service called Red Brick Africa, and also the founder of Papa Bear. Uh, which is, encourages exceptional fatherhood in Nairobi, Kenya. And we'll have Arjun Krishna Lal, who's the author of the novel Wicked Games, a uh, book about high schoolers in India, and is the director of content strategy for the Fly Flying V Group. So you'll want to join us for that. I'll tell you, Holland, this whole theme that we are thinking about 
um, and global connections has just been so enlightening. So again, thank you to Julia and David. But all of you who are our listeners and subscribers, please leave us a review, rate us on Apple Podcasts, become a subscriber because it does help us keep the conversations going. It's part of our community and our connection. And you can also, as always, please remember that you are welcome at our table.